And uh, Sherman asked, like, when kids are doing online learning, there's a certain level of uh, self-discipline for the kids to get through uh, the learning yeah. material. And how do we help them motivate themselves to finish the work without sitting next to them and constantly monitor like a helicopter parent? <laughs> Right, right. I, I love all the new expressions that we have with helicopter parent and snow plow parent. We and, love you know, like labeling pushing. like parents, right? Like it's like screen yeah. time. Like we put labels on everything, right? Exactly. It's like, oh. it's like so leave us alone. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like sharing thing. Sharing like, yeah. like parents are sharing too much of like what their yes, kids are doing. Over sharing them, like, thing. Sharing thing, over sharing thing. thing. Yes, and I'm like, exactly. oh, like, we come up with great names for, for like, we do. We do. And as long as parents feel bad. <laughs> yeah, I was just getting ready to say that. As long as we're not shaming them, I'm okay with it. You know, I I, I like some of the, the, the expressions myself. Um, but, but but back to your, your question. Um, I think that it depends on the age, right? Uh, because it, there's different motivations. And again, I think I always think this is a really interesting part about being a digital parenting consultant is that I'm talking about really the things that are, that are uh, the technology and the devices, the social media, internet, et cetera. I'm not talking about pure parenting and yet it always gets back down to pure parenting. Um, and I would say, you know, if you have a, a, a question and you're thinking about it in your mind, take the tech out, right? So take the tech out and then figure out how would you handle this, uh, this problem if it was not about remote learning. So going back to our situation, we have your child, um, let's say they're not remote learning, because I agree, we're talking about the self-discipline, but it's just a matter of going to school. And you see they're sitting by a window and out that window is all sorts of activities and they're just, you know, always looking out the window. How are you going to know if your child is going to complete the lesson and understand the lesson? Well, one of the things that you can do is what you would, what you can do with the online world as well is when we're talking younger children before the lesson starts, you say, hey, so um, after your lesson, I would love it if you told me like the top two, three things that you learned, the most important. So then you know that they have to um, they have to, uh, you know, give you a summary or finish it out. If the courses are being recorded, you can even say something like, I would love to know what happens at the one minute mark, at the 20 minute mark, or at the 40 second minute mark. And that way they're really, you know, watching the clock and paying attention as well. I mean, it's always about trying to find, I won't say parenting hacks, because I used this before. And one of my cybersecurity friends said, Elizabeth, stop saying hacks. We're not hacking. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> it's, it's just a trick. Uh, a strategy is, you know, to get creative. And, and sometimes as well, it's just as simple as, um, you know, think about when your children didn't want to go to school at all. And you would say, go to school, you're going to have a great day. And then it's going to be mommy and me afternoon, or we're going to, you know, go by the library, grab a book, uh, you know, find something that's pleasurable for them to do. And, and I'm not saying bribery or reward system, hardcore compensation, but, you know, quite frankly, we go to work because we get paid. <laughs> <laughs> so a little bit of, of, of a reward, even if, like I said, if it's just a super mommy cuddle, I think that works too. Uh, I love that. And I, I see it as, you know, getting them into doing it in a different way is, is very powerful, especially if we, because nowadays we're in this world where like kids have gone from the classroom to their living rooms. And so what's happening is we're no longer competing with other distracted uh, kids in a very controlled environment, we are now competing with Xbox and movies and social media and everything else that, that can be out there. And so it is really difficult as a parent to go and compete with the interests of like the, these produced uh, media. And so it is very important to like, if you understand them and you understand like, why do they like it so much? And, and where do they want to go? Like, what would what would be the next step with that? Then it, in terms of motivation and getting them to do their work, like I always say that there are no boring tasks, only boring imaginations. And so if they can't connect it to their imagination, that's one of the reasons why they say, oh, this is so irrelevant. So if you've got that motivation, they're going to do this on their own. But if you don't and you say, no, you're going to sit down and you're going to write through all of these examples. <laughs> you're just like, oh, and I do feel like this is this is like for me, it's insane. Like one week, the, my kid's in grade two and, and he'll get like 40 pages of like worksheets that he has to do. And it takes like two hours a day to do. It's insane. And at some right. point we have to say, you know what? We're not gonna do all those. Um, yeah, like it, exactly. we could, but it's not gonna help him. It, like, it's gonna make him like, like really not attracted mm. to math at all. 
Like we right. need to, the uh, interest tr is more important than like going through everything. Like this attachment that we have as parents, like they must complete everything, I think is right. another, another challenge as well. Um, yeah, and oh, I man. loved, I, I, but you just said something got me all excited too. And you were talking about um, just the distractions and even with the math. And so then, I'm sorry, this is where like you can see I'm a total tech enthusiast and I'm saying there are opportunities here, right? So, you know, with the math and all those math sheets, you know, why not go online and do like, come on math using the app or whatever else is a Khan Academy. Um, there are so many fantastic fun ways of doing math now that are completely different from when I was a kid. And you can just, you know, ha just have a great time. And in that same vein, we were talking about some of the older um, teenagers and uh, self-discipline and, and, and self-regulation. You know, there is technology that can help for that too. There's like the Freedom app or, or even just screen time on your Apple phone or using um, Android's digital well-being, which will, you know, shut down. So that way your child can be in school at school time. They won't be able to go out on 20 different browsers and, you know, watch YouTube while they're streaming Netflix and they're supposed to be listening to English class, right? So, I mean, parents, you have to get a little involved here. You have to, you know, check things out and talk with them. Uh, it's that way you can kind of tone it down a bit. So, uh, again, the the chat, uh, we have Faith saying, like, we found other things that help as well, like she knits and we do a lot of family yeah. things, uh, dinners, no tech in the it. rooms at nighttime. That's a great one. Uh, Edna yeah. says, very insightful. Do you think putting up a personal development programs for kids in the digital space, uh, would that be of some help to get them to build up quality screen time? Oh, that's an interesting one, Edna. I think, quite frankly, anything that we can do uh, to help our children uh, in, in uh, help our children's development, personal development, mental, social, and emotional learning, um, I, I say go for it. If there is a way to combine all of that and it's in a digital space, even even more so. Um, I had the pleasure of working on uh, a project um, in Europe that was funded by the European Commission in 2014-2016, and we were looking at um, um, uh, cyberbullying and bullying, and we were looking at social and emotional learning, and uh, we looked at children ages 11 to 14, and we were just trying to, you know, figure all of these things out. And Edna, it's exactly as you said, it's, you know, at this developmental stage, um, when can we get in and really help children and support children? Well, what we realized at the end of this two-year project, looking at, um, I can't remember how many teens, but I would say at least a thousand in six different European countries, we realized that 11 to 14 was too late, that we needed to mm -hmm, go totally. younger to start. Yeah, we needed to go yeah. younger to start with social and emotional learning. So what I would think, Edna, would be to look at something like Denmark, a country's you know model. I think we should be cutting and pasting and not reinventing the wheel. Look at countries where um, some of these programs work and they work really well, where they're teaching children social and emotional learning, uh, social and emotional learning from age three years old, right? So you can do that without screens uh, because they don't need it. Um, so three years, four years, five years, your developmental program until you're building them up into getting into digital spaces and they've already acquired the skills of kindness and empathy before they hit the digital space. And Edna, then I'm telling you, rock stars. I can just see it, so. <laughs> 100%. Um, so going back like we got a lot in the chat um these hacks are great i guess these questions work even when back to school because kids mm. go back to school march 1st here in malaysia right. uh so mm -hmm. oh, thank you sherman for joining us from malaysia uh it's an honor wow um you, yeah. he also asked like what was the first math app um you mentioned before khan academy oh yes um kumon uh k-u-m-o-n it was developed mm. in japan and um, I believe, yes, Japanese, yes. And uh, just a different way of approaching math, a completely different way of looking at it. Um, I've also seen another fantastic app, uh, I believe it's called brilliant.org that has different ways of looking at math um, on an on a app where it's you know spatial and things are moving around. And I'm like, my goodness, I could have really understood um, you know, Pygatherin's theorem and all this other kind of stuff if I had had these cool apps, but um, it's okay. <laughs> Words are my I, thing now. <laughs> If I can add to the um, the tool belt, especially for math, um, I've found that uh, straight up bribery does, like as you mentioned, does work. Um, so if you're doing mathematics in terms of like either like 
okay, we're doing a math example and I'm going to use real money. Like it suddenly becomes like it's super relevant to them. Or if you do a real example and you go, now I'm going to do it with M&Ms. Like, the, you know, like not the big ones, like the really small ones. And you go like, and if you don't get this right, you're going to get less M&Ms. Is that okay? Like, you know, this is, this is a real yeah. world example. So it suddenly goes from this abstract concept to this is less M&Ms. I got to learn this stuff now. Like I've got to figure this thing out. And my, my kids are really young. Uh, but it's right. it's it's amazing how like little like you don't need a lot to to get no. them to to go wow this is exactly why okay do I want like seven M and M's or do I want eleven M and M's I want eleven right so like how am I going to do that so <laughs> exactly yeah. and and as we say and doing geometry with uh, with pies and things that you can cut uh, into halves and three quarters and that works as well <laughs> thank you um. You know, as we transition, like one question that increasingly parents are asking related to screen time is we talked about that. You talked about quality and we were just like kind of scratching the surface of it. And I'm wondering, like, how do you know, like as a as a parent, how do you know I went from mm, like this is like kind of like not so great, the screen time versus like, wow, this is like really productive. What would like, how would you measure that? How would you, how would you even determine that, you know, that right. this is quality screen time? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there's two ways. Again, I'm always for the proactive, right? So if we're going to be proactive, that means that you're going to be guiding your child on uh, how to find um, educational. Yes, I said it, educational uh, uh, and entertaining content online. So my number one resource for all of those things is Common Sense Media, where you can go on and find, you know, apps and books and movie reviews. Um, and you can find parents guides to just about whatever it is that you're, you're looking for. And I think that that is one way to really make sure that your child is getting something with quality. And what's even better with common sense media is that they go in and they specifically tell you about the types of content, whether it has violence or profanity, um, whether it's um, educational. Uh, and I think the positive role models, I mean, I think those are all fantastic things. And one other little uh, tip that I think is great, especially for parents with younger children, because sometimes you don't always know. And Sesame Street is, you know, Sesame Street. And you, after a while, you're like, okay, what else can I show them? Um, is that you can just go on and, you know, for example, tick the little box for three-year-olds. And you can find all the content that it is appropriate for three-year-olds. Now, with that in mind, there are also parent reviews um, where the parents will talk about these um, items. And then what is my personal favorite as somebody who is a children children's rights advocate, and I believe always that we need to keep talking to our children, talk, 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 is that they ask the children, you know, what do you think about this? What age should it be? Did you like it? Did you not like it? So that is one way um, beforehand to find out about content um, and to find out, you know, what, it, what this is going to do for your child. The other way to find out about content is that reactive way that I was mentioning, which is we are, you're watching how your child is reacting uh, to certain um, films or apps or episodes. And I, you'll get a pretty good idea, you know, what, what riles them up, what gets them excited, what, when they watch something, you know, I don't know, Ed the Science Guy or, um, or um, you know, any of the little, I'm trying to remember all the things that my kids used to love when they were, when they were little, they're 11 and 14, but there were so many really good, um, uh, the Einsteins, there we go, I was thinking about the Einsteins, and then they get off. Little the Einsteins, the yes. Yeah, the little Einsteins, they stop watching the episode or they stop, uh, they stop, you know, playing with the app and then they want to go get pen and paper because they want to reproduce something that they had, that they had learned. I mean, th these are all indicators of, you know, the content that you want to get more of and the ones that you want to reduce uh, if you can. Uh, it, I think this is really powerful about the, having these right kind of resources that point towards the, the right direction. Because I would say that sure. for the most part, we're we're in a pretty different world now. Like people ask like, what's the difference between screen time today versus when we just watched TV as a kid? Um, and I guess a lot of it has to do with who curates or who determines the programming uh, for that. Right. It used to be a person uh, and now it is very much an algorithm or an AI who's making determinations uh, for that. And I'm yes. kind of curious, like, like there's no, there's not a lot of rules right now on AI, like recommending certain things to your kids. And if it mm -hmm. recommends something inappropriate, there's nothing, there's not a lot of rules that kind of prevent you 
like prevent companies yeah. from being liable if if that happens. Um, so I'm wondering, like, is that is, is that the current state of affairs right now? Is it, it's like the wild west? They can just give you whatever recommendation, or are is, are things like starting to change even from like a legal political perspective? Like, are are we going to start seeing some some broader changes in this space? Yeah, I, I personally, I think so. I think we're going to start seeing more regulation because it's already happening in the United States, also here in Europe. Um, but I do think that um, just because I'm, I'm, I, I do work, I consult for tech companies as well as um, non-governmental organizations and governments. So I do think that one of the things that that uh, can really support parents is to realize that all the tech companies have safety centers. They all have guidelines. They will tell you um, that their content is not for children uh, and how to um, set up parental controls, how to reduce, how to limit. After that, you know, when parents give an eight-year-old a TikTok account or a, a 10-year-old an Instagram account, and we know that these are for 13 and plus, we can't we can't really say anything. So you had said um used the word liable for tech companies, and I was like, ah, my lawyer hat came on saying, don't we're not going to say liable uh, right now because that's 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 not what we're talking about. Um, but really, let's just say that these are very challenging times. Um, and I think that if, just for example, something really simple when we're talking YouTube, um, if you do not want your children going down the uh, the the rabbit hole of, of of suggestions, well then turn off the automated recommendation and that you know the next thumbnail uh, that will keep coming up. Same thing with Netflix. If you don't want them to sit there and watch episode after episode, turn that off. You, there's a button that you can press so that you don't have to automatically see watch next episode. And how do I know this? Because I watched the Bridgertons probably in like <laughs> four hours. <laughs> Definitely a weekend for sure. And um, so, you know, do, do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> You know what? Um, I, I think that that's the key. Um, we didn't we didn't talk about liability, but I do feel like yeah. eventually there's a lot of rules that we have in in media production, especially like involving children, like rating systems, um, compensation for child actors. Like how much are many of the child actors like Ryan's Toys Review is actually going to get when they're older? Like we don't we have no idea. Like the rules are different. We don't treat them like we treat a child actor right now. In the United States, but maybe in other regions, we're starting to do that. Like these, these kind of things are are coming, but they're they're definitely they're like they're they don't exist yet because the, the technology is usually ahead of where where we are in terms of the, exactly. the legal practice. And and I'm so excited that you mentioned that because um, I am in Paris, France, and just a few weeks ago, I'm just uh, you know with the pandemic, I never remember if it was last week or last month, uh, but France did um, start the first law for child influencers. So here now um, in France, if a child influencer is making money, so that's kind of the only tricky part. But if they're making yeah. money, then any of those revenue that revenue has to be held for them until they're um, of majority age, and they also are treated like a um, a child television star. So they have, you know, working hours, et cetera. Um, and so I think all of that is really exciting. And I think it's because other countries are looking to see what's happening in the United States. And they didn't really like the idea that uh, Ryan made what twenty six million or maybe even more, and uh, we have no yeah we have no idea. And I think there's Anastasia as well, who's in Florida, and, and you know million dollar kids, and and we this is always down to children's rights, right? And if the and if the parents are you know taking care of business, well then uh, already I say that's great because that's our role. We are the guardians of our children. We are the digital guardians of our children. Um, so yeah, I think it's going to be exciting to see what happens. Yes, I, I've said this before um, privately, but I, I do really feel that like France is going to be the source of our, our digital revolution. They're, they're definitely pushing the boundaries a little bit sooner than, than other regions in the world. And I'm, I'm honored that uh, like we're, we're learning a little bit more about what other regions are, are doing beyond uh, just uh, what we're seeing in the United States, because we, we need reform. Right. We need some, some thinking around this. And uh, hmm. there's a lot of language about switching existing things that we use for, say, straight media production and seeing how that might apply. Like even here in Canada, uh, we've got like stuff in the news this morning about like news outlets and you're going to have to like pay a certain amount, you know, because like even on social media, if you have news there, you will owe something right. to the, the news organizations, which is valuable because we have a right. a news organization that is running like, what is it, like a fraction of their, their previous capacity. So their ability mm -hmm. to even do news 
is uh, severely limited. So we we definitely benefit from that. Um, I'm gonna go yeah, back no, to I, the audience. I was just gonna I, say I one more thing. Yeah, 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 before you go back, see, so, so you get me now, you get me talking, so you're going to just like say, Elizabeth, <laughs> stop. Um, but uh, I was just going to say, yes, the, the countries that I would say to continue watching, um, France, the United Kingdom, and Germany. Uh, that's what I'm seeing here in Europe. And then, of course, um, everything that's happening with the European Commission. So the, that's where you should keep an eye out just to see if, what's going to happen in the United States. And uh, if I if I have any advanced knowledge, I will share. <laughs> yeah, in, in like in particular with the um the GDPR, like the global data protection regulation, I do feel that much of that is already moving far ahead of what we can see in North America. Um and I think that if anything they're they're leading a little bit in terms of uh privacy regulation. I do think the there's a good sign. There's a good sign from yeah. that because you have to make consequences that are financial. Uh, because a lot of decisions are going to be financial and you won't see any changes until it has an impact on the bottom line to that extent. And so uh, this is, uh, we were talking earlier about how, like in the news, you know, some of the, some additional individuals from the uh, Google, I think, AI ethics team were let go just recently and mm. how it's very difficult for us to police itself when it comes to ethics. Um, you know, it, it's it's very because it has to be a financial incentive. So we, we depend a lot on regulation and we depend a lot on the law in order to provide this type of guidance. And uh, right. hopefully uh, we like we're seeing yeah. we're starting to see some trends. It's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. So um, stepping back into the um, to the math side, remember, we were like recently talking yes. about like different ways of engaging with math. Uh, one of the things that uh, Sherman said was uh, it's Chinese New Year's here and social gambling is uh, happening down here. So the game 21 uh, makes them do lots of mental math. And so, I mean, we all have really strong examples of, of this and I'm, I'm glad to see it. Um, oh, uh, and I think that, you know, having resources, like where do you go, right? Like what is the one place? And I, I feel like, if anything, that's what we like are here for. We're trying to curate, get put those places together because yeah. we we need like as parents to get together and say like, yeah, we're we're gonna figure out how to make this happen. And so yeah. that's kind of good opportunity to connect with the community. Uh, yeah, I com I um, completely agree, and I feel like you just kind of just handed me like a baby to say here, 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 because that's one of the things that I do with my uh, digital parenting community on Facebook is that, you know, we just share the best practices. Um, you know, I curate as much as I can. And because I'm in the academic space, because I'm working with governments, because I'm working with NGOs, because I'm even going into classrooms and talking to kids and Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts. And, you know, a couple years ago, it was more fun because I'd go into a classroom and actually do all the Fortnite dances with the kids. And uh, it's just kind of crazy. Even last week, I was doing a call um, with some an international school in Lisbon, in Portugal, and I was doing. Um, I had some of the students speaking French, and uh, one of the girls was asking me, "Well, why do you know so much about these games, about Among Us and Minecraft and Roblox, and you know, how do you? Are you an adult? Why are you playing these games?" And it was just really hysterical because I wanted to, I had to reassure her that I do not spend all day playing games but that I talk to my children, you know? And so this is the this is the the big difference. But anyway, what I was saying is that by using all of those different pieces, um, that's how I'm able to pull it all together and really try to provide parents with a sort of holistic approach to, to digital parenting. 